Hi, I'm John Kate, lead singer and songwriter of the Van Gogh Brothers. On behalf of the Music Museum of New England, a nonprofit enterprise dedicated to capturing the popular musical history of New England. With me today is Ryan Walsh, founder of the Americana band Hallelujah the Hills and author of Astral Weeks, A Secret History of 1968, which chronicles Van Morrison's time in Boston during the period, as well as the evolution of music and culture in Boston during that time. Good morning, Ryan. Hey, how are you? Thanks for having me. Great to see you, great to meet you, and I'm glad we got to connect yesterday. Thanks for that. Um, we'll get into some of that special talk later. Um, but um, I thought maybe we could start out this morning uh, with what I call the van connection, which really, um, I wanted to understand, and maybe you can let folks understand better, um, your connection to van, and, and then van's connection to Boston. Um, okay. yeah. yeah, like ha, ha, why Van Morris? I mean, you weren't alive when Van was around at that time. Right. So what, why Van Morrison? How did that happen? Uh, it, ha I, it happened just by a weird happenstance. I, my family, you know, I got most of my musical cues from, cues from my older brothers and they weren't big Van Morrison fans and I never got into him. But then, uh, when I was in my young twenties, when I was especially sad and like lonely, heartbroken dude, I came, I was buying a lot of records and I came upon that album cover and that title in a store. And I was like, I think I should buy this. I, I want to know what kind of music is on an album like this. And it was, uh, the album was like medicine for me. I just kept listening to it, made me feel a little better. And it, um, it just became my favorite album. I, like some other Van Morrison stuff, but it's mostly about that record for me. Wow. Do um, did did you did did does does that music inform your own musical work? Uh, no. I mean, if you look, uh, uh, Hollywood in the Hills sounds all different. We work in all different kinds of sounds and genres, I think. But um, we've never done an all acoustic album. Or uh, no, I, 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 it must be. I must have absorbed it in some way, but we no way try to um, strive for that same kind of achievement. You know what I mean? I do, I do. I just, you know, I just kind of wondered um, because I have listened to your work, and and I've read, of course, I've read the book, and I was wondering yeah. if you know how that informed. Um, your work, so maybe we'll have a an acoustic album to look forward to sometime. In the <laughs> That'd be awesome. Um, and that was one of my questions. Um, has Astral Weeks informed your work? Um, <clears throat> and can you tell us a little bit? You know, because this is a surprise even to many people of my generation um, that Van Morrison was even in Boston. Can you talk right. a bit about um, how he came to Boston and why? Sure. The process of figuring it out, of course, for me, started on the back of the record where there's that poem written and signed by Morrison, and it mentions Hyannisport, Cape, and Cambridge. And uh, personally, like a dummy that I am, I was like, well, those must be places in Ireland, too, because I grew up in Dedham, and there's a Dedham, England, of course, so I just said, that's what's going on here. And then when I realized that wasn't the case, um, that blew my mind because, oh, it's my favorite record and I love my city. Now they're connected. I have to figure out why. And um, long story short is that he had a terrible record deal in New York City, Bang Records. When Burt Burns, the owner, died, um, his mob associates kind of took over and Morrison fled to Cambridge to get away from this guy named Carmine Wassel de Noya and kind of tr figure out how to restart his career. Wow. Okay. So it was sort of, um, he was sort of escaping from a situation then coming here. Yeah. It was like, it, it is an exile moment in his life and career, which wow. is um, always it for, I, th I think those moments are interesting in people's lives. Do you, and do you have any idea why Boston? Like, did he know someone here? It was hard to figure that out specifically, but 
I think there were a couple of things. There was a manager, independent manager from Boston named Richard Rober. And he kind of threw a lifeline out to Van and Janet and said, there's clubs here. Uh, I'm, I'm starting to manage people. Why don't you come here? Um, and so that was the initial call. I think that the, um, you know, the folk scene where Dylan was a, a tangential part of that helped because he'd already loved Dylan. And uh, what other option did he have? I think it was slim picking. So off to Boston he went. And, you know, Rober, uh, that manager, turned out to be um, his own set of problems and didn't work out. But the the whole Boston time for Morrison is weird and crazy, but it all kind of works out in the end, on um, almost against odds, you know? Well, that's what I took away from the book. It was like it was definitely against odds. Um, and I and I was trying to also to glean from the book sort of, well, he came to Boston and there was like this loose connection, but but was it, you know, did he sort of become part of the music scene here? Um, was it the music scene that drew him? Um, uh, were people sort of happy to see him? Uh, uh, was there a sense of community? I mean, it, it's from what I figured out, he kind of created his own little circle, his own little community. But as far as Boston rolling out the red carpet for the singer of Brown Eyed Girl and them, um, that wasn't happening. Um, you know, there's a, a UK transplant in the book, David Silver. He was probably the biggest them fan that Van met while he was here, outside of Peter Wolf, of course. You know, Van became friends with Peter Wolf. He started to hook up with Boston musicians. Um, could we, could we talk it, about that for a sec? Could we yeah, just Because sure. Peter, of course, is, you know, known and, and beloved here. Um, how, how, how did they meet? Um, according to uh, Peter's story that um, they met at the tea party because Van walked in looking for gigs. The tea, Boston Tea Party was that rock palace run by Ray Reapin over on Berkeley Street. And it was, you know, new and the place to be. And Van walked in looking for a gig. And then um, after talking with Peter for a while, figured out he was also that overnight DJ at BCN, the Woofa Goofa, and they became good friends. Because Van had been sending in postcards requesting certain songs, I guess. Oh, th that's right. I remember that now from the book. Okay, yeah. So Van, Van wrote in to BCN. And I remember, <clears throat> I actually remember, I was young, but I was around. I remember Peter being on BCN, and and I remember BCN going on the air. It had been a classical uh, music station, um, right. except for the twelve to six slot, and they right. played yeah. rock and roll or you know new rock and roll. Uh, it was really the first. I think it was the first FM sort of album oriented rock station in the country, and Peter. Maybe Maybe yeah. not in the country, but def for sure in New England. Definitely in New England, yeah. And uh, and I remember Peter being on there. And uh, wow, what a uh, what a confluence of events that um, that the Tea Party would be going, that BCN would be coming on the air. Do you know? Um, uh, so so Peter and Van became friends. Do you know if, if Peter was a supporter of Van's music? Do you know what that relationship was like? Uh, yeah, you know, uh, the first, I think the first time Van Morrison appears on stage at the Tea Party is during a hallucination set, which is Peter Wolf's first band. And Wolf invited Van up to perform Gloria. I think the hallucination started to play Gloria, and Van, who had had a few drinks, sang a different song on top of it. So it was like an early oh. mashup there. Awesome. And the crowd. The crowd was confused, and then I guess Wolf yelled at the crowd, like, don't you know who this is? He wrote Gloria. And um, Wow. Uh, again, not the red carpet you might expect. No, but what, a, what a beautiful thing of Peter to do, to, you know, sort of wrap his arms around him and, and sort of act as the referee between, you know, sort of what I'm imagining sort of a typical Boston crowd, you know. They're going right, to like right. how they feel. Arms crossed. Like. Yes. <laughs> yes, I've played to those crowds. Um, and so have you, I'm sure. <laughs> That's awesome. 
So um, I just want to touch on, just to round this out, because we'll get more in depth, but there, were, there was this, um, a little bit of a three-legged stool at that time in Boston between, and I'll just from a media perspective, of the Boston Tea Party, um, WBCN, and um, later, of course, the Boston After Dark and the Phoenix, and Ray Reapin was at the center of this. And can you tell us a little bit about this Ray Reapin character? Sure. I mean, um, the the Globe uh, often called him the hippie entrepreneur. He was a can he was a lawyer from Kansas, came to Harvard for grad school, and then his acquaintanceship uh, with Jesse Benton um, kind of dra dragged him into the rock and roll world, and and he kind of found some easy successes there. I mean. Um, she, they wanted, uh, Jesse Benton in the Fort Hill community wanted to run a cinema tech show, movies there. Ray Reapin had the money and put it up on his own. When the cinema tech kind of petered out, he decided to throw some dances for the kids as he told the, uh, the Boston, uh, the course, licensing right? board. Yeah. And, um, before anyone knew it, he had, uh, the hottest club in town and, um, you know, all these amazing rock bands who are now legends, you know, rolling into the South End, dragging gear up two flights of stairs and playing that beautiful original Tea Party room. Right. Um, Jesse Benton, can you just, uh, so that we set the table here for future um, discussion. So, and Jesse Benton was who? Jesse Benton was uh, uh, the daughter of famous American painter, Thomas Hart Benton. And at the time had just married Mel Lyman, um, folk harmonica, banjo player, uh, the man who said he was God in the pages of Avatar. And Ray Reapin arranged Jesse's divorce so she could marry Mel. So kind of like that whole sequence of event, that do divorce, the marrying of Mel, is kind of the inciting action for the Tea Party and all those counterculture uh, um, staples, like you mentioned. And Matt, Mel, of course, led the um, Lyman family um, up on Fort Hill where the original Tea Party was, right? No, the original Tea Party was Berkeley Street, but it was originally a split venture between Ray and his concerts and the Cinematheque where they showed avant-garde experimental films. Okay, so it was the Cinematheque. Was that on Fort Hill or was that on Berkeley? Berkeley. Okay. All right. So I th I thought the Cinematheque was on Fort Hill. So it was actually, that was the original Tea Party. I think it was 53 Berkeley. Precisely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's that was the Tea Party. Um, wow. What a confluence. Ray, so Ray comes into town to go to grad school or law school or whatever, and then um, meets Benton, arranges her divorce so she can marry Mel Lyman of all people, um, and then uh, and then and then it and then from that extension the Cinematheque and then the Tea Party and then later BCN and Avatar. Uh, just if we could speak about Avatar real quick. So so Avatar was the was that the Lyman family's newspaper? Was that Mel's publication? I mean, a lot of people thought it was, and it certainly turned into pretty much that, but. It was a collaboration with David Wilson, who had been publishing Broadside for many years. He and some others were the people who really knew how to publish a newspaper. But um, uh, more and more pages devoted to Mel and the family and pictures of the tower and pictures of him and letters to Mel with each um, issue that came out. Um, but they also covered local politics, national politics, music scene astrology columns it was you know it's a wild newspaper to look through amazing time capsule but uh there's a part in the book where things come to a head between the hill people and the valley people where they have a fight over what is this paper for is it to put mail up on a pedestal or talk about um all the things that all of us want to talk about and that fight gets um bizarrely intense right <laughs> right um great well that that sort of sets the stage so so Van came to Boston in exile, which is right. really cool. And, um, and he came at a time where there was this confluence of events. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, coincidence or not? 
Um, so uh, that was a, that was a time. And just to touch on the uh, the Tea Party a little bit, of course, the Boston Tea Party uh, became a very important uh, club here, um, originally owned by by Ray, right? And, yes, uh, and then and uh, David Hahn. I'm sorry, and, and a gentleman named David Hahn uh, owned a stake in it too. Right. So, and then later on, of course, it got sold to Don Law, mm -hmm. and we kind of uh, many of us Bostonians know that history, right? Or, or Don managed it. Um, Don was the second manager. Um, I, I, you know, after the second location closed, he opened Tea Party Productions, I think, which was his concert promotion business. Right. But. Uh, uh, I'm unclear if he ever owned a stake in, in the Tea Party or was just a paid manager. Oh, interesting. Okay. I think uh, I think the uh, assumption of many uh, here in Boston is that Don owned the Tea Party, but uh, but he, he was the manager. And just to sort of finish up this part of our talk, um, I had a question about uh, the British invasion and Van. Um, because mm -hmm. I think it was uh, Don and with Frank Barcelona, who the agent who brought um, so many of those British bands through the Tea Party. Um, did Van intersect with that at all? Well, it's interesting. You know, Don Law is the one who starts to book UK acts at the Tea Party. You know, they're not big enough to sell out arenas like they will be in five, seven years. But um, with the emergence of these rock palaces, in, in uh, America, you, th these bands start to come over. And, um, you know, Van Morrison could have easily been considered part of that, but at the time he lived in walking distance of the club, and as opposed to like Fleetwood Mac, who, you know, flew over. Uh, so it, um, it was, you know, again, it's like he's, uh, he's a stranger in a strange land. And, um, but yes, Don Law is the one who starts to bring over those those overseas acts. Amazing, and and so I I sort of in my mind I was thinking, and I was looking for this in the book was well, wow. So these Brits come over, and Van would have this you know camaraderie with the Brits, but you know it doesn't appear that he really did. It he was kind of still on his own island. I, I, yeah, I don't know. I'm sure he went to those shows. I don't know. Um, I don't know much about the intersection with, you know, you know, Peter Wolf told me that him and Van used to hang out late nights party with a lot of the bands who were coming through to the tea party. So who knows? Cool. cool. All right, Ryan. Well, thank you very much for that. And we'll come back in a few minutes with um, the next segment. All right. Thank you.